Amen. Thank you. Thank you, choir. Uh, good thing we're not judged on the way we sing. Or no, I'm kidding. No, that was beautiful. That was really beautiful. That one song, "Marching to Zion." That's an Isaac Watts. What's that? <laughs> you did. You did a wonderful job. Wonderful job. "Marching to Zion." That's an Isaac Watts song. I, I've never heard that before. That that refrain. That beautiful song. Thank you, guys. Thank you, Kevin, for leading so faithfully. Um, give them a round of applause if you. Don't. Yeah, absolutely. I'm trying to cover myself up now since <laughs> uh, Ruth chapter 1. We're going to be in Ruth chapter 1. Um, beautiful story of Ruth. How many of you have read the book of Ruth? How many of you have read it? Okay. Well, we're going we're gonna to walk you through it over the next few weeks. The book of Ruth. I may say the gospel of Ruth. It, it, it is a gospel story. You see the demonstration of the faithfulness of God in this particular story. What a beautiful story it is. Uh, we'll talk about that more in a moment. Um, Ruth chapter 1, we're going to go through the entire chapter. We're going to spend about four weeks in the book of Ruth, uh, so just a chapter per week. As uh, the majority of you know, uh, Kaylee and I took Sophia. Hey, Sophia. <gasps> hey, baby. <laughs> so we took Sophia back to uh, the hospital on Wednesday uh, to have everything checked out. She had a procedure done. They called it a surgery, which really freaked me out. It wasn't surgery. When I hear the word surgery, I think of scalpel. Uh, but it wasn't a surgery. They, it was just a procedure, but they had to put her to sleep, they, uh, anesthesia, stuff like that. And this was her six-month checkup just to see how the hemangioma, all the stuff, how her uh, trachea was doing, uh, her windpipe. And so we went back. And uh, my experience there, I don't know about for Kaylee, but my experience brought back all these memories from our previous uh, experience there back in January, and with that brought back all these different emotions and thoughts and kind of what I was processing through that time. And there was one instance uh, kind of echoing back to our experience in January that really set the tone and I think relates to the story in Ruth chapter 1. Uh, it was a Thursday afternoon, Kaylee and I, back in January, Kaylee and I went down, we had uh, lunch, we went to go get lunch, she was, Sophia was put to sleep, had an MRI, and, and so that freaked us out, I mean, having your daughter put to sleep is one thing, and then having them take her away is a completely different other situation, so we're alone, and we're sitting in the little cafe, and we're eating our food, we went back up to the room, she was there, and uh, she she had been crying, and uh, after she had been crying for a little bit of time, some of the nurses came in and tried to soothe her down. And one of the social workers, I guess that's what they call them, the social people, they, she came in and brought in a music box, a green little music box that they put on the side of her crib. And this music box, it's supposed to soothe the child, make the child uh, calm down. It irritated me to death. It played this depressing, melancholy type music, and it wasn't soothing Sophia. It was just making me angry because I'm hearing this depressing music. I'm looking at my daughter with all these tubes and wires protruding out of her. She's wheezing because wheezing she can't breathe very well. And in this moment of desperation, I put my head on the window, and I'm looking at her, hearing this depressing music, and I ask the question, God, where are you? I asked the question. I know it may not be Christian of me to ask the question, but I did it anyway, to be honest with you. God, where are you in this very moment? Watching her going through this suffering, this trial, hearing this depressing music, so psychologically I'm already freaked out a little bit. Seeing all this, going through this trial and situation, I asked the question, God, where are you? Where are you in this moment when the circumstance feels as though you are against me, God? Where are you? You know, that question is a question that I'm sure all of us at some particular point in time, we may not, may not have phrased it that way, but it's, we felt that at some particular point in time. It's part of our human experience, especially as a Christian, because we know that as a Christian, we're going to go through some trials, aren't we? <laughs> it's not an easy life. You lose a loved one. You go through trials. You see someone suffer, and you ask the question, God, where are you? This feeling of hopelessness, this feeling of fear and curiosity because you don't know what's going on. Ultimately, it comes down to a root issue that you feel abandoned by God. Just be honest. You feel as if the God of the universe looks down upon you, and he says, I hate you, alfalfa. The quote from Little Rascals. It feels as though God himself 
has abandoned you. Have you ever felt that once before in your life? Okay, just make sure we're on the same page. You know, there's a character in our story, Naomi, who feels the exact same way. The story is told uh, highlighting the perspective of Naomi. Actually, the story of Ruth is a story of God's faithfulness to Naomi and ultimately the people of Israel. But as we see over the next few weeks, we're going to see this display and the faithfulness and the demonstration of God's covenant love towards his people shown through the interactions of people. It's a beautiful story the way it's told. But what we're going to see this morning is the human experience of abandonment. There's several times, at least three or four times, where Naomi explicitly says, God is against me. He's brought this calamity upon me. He has uh, caused me uh, to be bitter. And all these different types of emotions that you see from her perspective. I'm going to keep saying that phrase from her perspective. But look with me, beginning in Ruth chapter 1, beginning in verse 1. It says, in the days when the judges ruled, we'll talk about that in a moment, there was a famine in the land. And a man in Bethlehem of Judea went to sojourn or to reside, take up residence, In the country of Moab, he and his wife and his two sons. And the man's name was Elimelech. The name Elimelech Elimelech means my God is king. We'll see the irony of that. And his wife's name, the name of his wife was Naomi, meaning pleasant. And the names of his two sons were Malon and Kilion. We'll talk about those names. And they were Ephrites uh, from Bethlehem and Judea. And they went into the country of Moab and remained there. Will you pray with me for a moment? Great God and Savior, uh, we come to you and we pray, Lord, that you would speak to us this morning. What a prayer it is to ask the God of the entire universe to reside among us and to speak to us through his word. And we're asking that this morning, that you would do big things among us. Lord, that you would send your spirit to uh, teach us this morning as we begin to look into your word and examine what you would have to say to us through it. Lord, that you would crucify me, that you would Allow me to die as I preach this morning, and I ask God that Jesus would be exalted, and we would make much of him in everything that we do. And we pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. And so the setting of the story is very interesting because it doesn't start off on a very good foot, does it? It starts off with a famine in the land of Bethlehem or in the town of Bethlehem. Do you know what Bethlehem means? It means the house of bread. Very interesting. The word bet means house. The word lechem in Hebrew means bread. And so the house of bread. Now notice the irony. There is a famine in the house of bread. And so it didn't start off very good. We think, we think of love stories. For example, most commentators believe this is a love story. We're calling our series through the book of Ruth the Redeeming Love series. Redeeming Love, Redemption in Ruth. And you think of a love story like Cinderella, once upon a time in a land far, far away, or Rapunzel, or whatever it is, whatever love story, Sleeping Beauty, whatever love story you want to pick and plug it in there, maybe not Romeo and Juliet, because that wasn't a very good love story, was it? It was a tragedy. It's interesting that this story begins tragically. It begins with a crisis. It doesn't begin once upon a time in a land, land far, far away. There were these two lovebirds and they decided to do wonderful, great things and live happily ever after. No, it begins with a man by the name of Elimelech, my God is king, who's an Israelite going to a foreign land because there's a famine in the house of bread. It begins almost, it seems like, on the foot of disobedience. It begins, ironically, this guy, his name is my God is king, going away from his God to a foreign land called the country of Moab. Now, the Moab, the country of Moab was an enemy of Israel. So they're going to a place that isn't very good for them. They're going uh, almost, it seems like, in disobedience. The text doesn't demonstrate for us uh, what they're thinking or anything like that, but it seems like they're going off into this tragic crisis. And so you have the two names. You have the wife named Pleasant, uh, Naomi, and then you have the two names, Malon and Kilion. These two names are interesting. You know what, they're, what they mean? It means sick and frail. And so you name your two sons, Malon and Kilion. Hey, sickly, come here. Hey, frailty, come here. And you know the story doesn't begin good when you name your two sons that way. All right? And so my God is king, pleasant, sickly, frail. They go to the country of Moab. 
and they reside there. But notice verse 3. There's a crisis, a disruption that happens in the narrative. Verse 3, but Elimelech, my God, is king, the husband of pleasant Naomi, died. So you know it doesn't begin well. When the story starts off with death. He died, and she was left with her two sons, and they took Moabite wives, which you're not supposed to. If you're an Israelite, you're not supposed to take foreign wives. You're disobeying God there. So they take Moabite wives in an act of disobedience, it seems like. And one was named Orpah, which, interesting, her name means gazelle, fast running, something like that. And the other was named, now in Hebrew, this is really stressed, the other was named Ruth. The emphasis is on Ruth itself. Her name means friend, which we'll see that here in a moment, uh, why that's so important. And they lived there about 10 years, so they resided there for about 10 years. But both Malon, Sickly, and Kilion, frailty, died. And so the woman was left without two sons and her husband. Now, notice the tragedy here. Notice the tragedy. You see this family completely fall apart. They're in this land where they're not supposed to be in the first place. They're leaving because the, it seems like they're not trusting God enough in this famine. They're not believing God through it. They don't have enough faith to get through it. So can you blame them? They go off to a place where they're going to find food. But the irony is my God as king doesn't really trust his God to be king. You see Malon and Kilion, they die. Elimelech dies. And then Naomi, pleasant, is left with these two foreign daughter-in-laws. In a land where she doesn't even know. A land she's not comfortable in. She's been there for 10 years. But a land that, honestly, she shouldn't be in in the first place. And so this is how the story of Ruth begins. Isn't it an interesting way that it begins? It doesn't start off like normal stories. Like a normal love story. It starts off with a tragedy, a crisis. The crisis of death. But notice what Naomi begins to do in verse 6. She picks the story. We see the story pick up a little bit more. And then she arose with her daughter-in-laws to return from the country of Moab. You see that word return? It's going to show up several times in our passage. Very important. She arose with her daughters all to return from the country of Moab. For, here's the reason she's going back. For, she heard in the fields of Moab that the Lord, Yahweh, has visited his people and given them food. She heard that God is acting in Israel. And so because of that, she says, hey, I don't have anything to do. I'm in this foreign land. I have these two daughters-in-law. And so in order to repair the disruption, in order to repair this crisis in her life, she decides to return back to Bethlehem, to the house of bread, where God is now providing for his people. And so she set out to the place in verse 7 where she was with her two daughters-in-law and they went to return back to the land of Judah. But, verse 8, Naomi said to her two daughters-in-law, Go, return, each of you to your mother's house. May the Lord deal kindly with you as you have dealt with me and the dead. So interesting here, you have this first interaction, you have a series of three interactions that shows up in the text. We'll, We'll discuss them As we begin, verse 8, it says, she's saying, go back, daughters-in-law. Go back. Now, why would she say such a thing? I mean, wouldn't she want to be with her daughter-in-laws? Wouldn't she want someone to be around her? You would think that, but it's interesting. The covenant that they had, that Malon and Kilion had with Ruth and Orpah, the covenant was broken because they died. And so there is no legal binding here. For uh, Ruth and Orpah and uh, Naomi. There's no legal legal binding. The covenant's broken because the marriage is is done. They died. There's no legal binding. So what she's saying is, return. Go back. Go back to your security. Go back to the place that you find security and rest and safety. Go back to your hometown. Go back to your parents' house. I mean, look down. It says, and the Lord may grant you to find rest or security. Each of you in the house of your husband. So she has this idea now that you're going to go find a husband. And then she kissed them and they lifted up their voices and wept. But notice it says right in the middle, may the Lord deal kindly with you. May the covenant God of Israel bless you. May the covenant God of Israel bless you keep you and prosper you in the land of Moab. She has no tie to her daughters-in-law here. 
So uh, seems logical. Just go. Leave me. You don't need to take care of me. I can take care of myself. But what do they do? They lift up their voices and they cry. But notice verse 10 here. Notice what the two daughters-in-law do, Ruth and Orpah. And they said to her, no, no, we will, we're not going to return. We're not going to return back to Moab. We want to return with you and to your people. Very important. We want to go to Israel. We want to go where God is working. We want to go back to the house of bread. We want to return there. Oh, Naomi, let us go. You see the intensity of this. No, let us go. But notice verse 11. And Naomi said, turn back, my daughters. You have this interaction again, the second interaction. Turn back. Go back. But notice she gives these reasons here. For I have yet to have sons in my womb that may become your husband. So she's starting giving some reasons here. Return back. Go back, run away from me, go back to Moab. Why? Because I can't provide you any husbands. I can't provide some sort of security for you. She said, turn back in verse 12. My daughters, go find your way for I am old and I have no husband. If I say I have hope, even if I should have a husband this very night and bear sons, would you therefore wait till I'm, wait till they're grown? Would you refrain from marrying until then? I mean, that's illogical, right? She's saying that even if I had a husband tonight, are you going to wait 18 years before they grow up and get, have the opportunity to get married? No, that's the point for Naomi. It is ridiculous for you, Ruth and Orpah, to follow me, follow me back to Bethlehem because it is better for you to go back to Moab and to begin your life once again. The point is, the irony is, she wants to go back alone. She wants, to go, she wants to go back without security. She wants to go back without some sort of protection. And notice what she's going back into. Remember verse 1, it says, In the days when the judges ruled, flip a page in your Bible and go back to the book of Judges with me. You see the very last verse in uh, verse, uh, chapter 21, verse 25? You see what it says there in verse 25? It says, In those days... In the time of the judges, there was no king in Israel. And everyone did what was right in their own eyes. That's where she's going back. She's going back into an environment in the time of the judges, going back to Israel, where there's no king, there's no ruler, there's no leader in Israel. There's complete anarchy and chaos in Israel because everybody was doing right in their own eyes. That is where she's returning back to. And she's saying to her daughters-in-law, Don't follow me. Do not return back with me. We have to ask the question, well, you're giving all these excuses, Naomi. She doesn't have a husband. She can't have any uh, sons for her daughter-in-law. So it seems logical, right? But notice the root cause. You see the root cause in this verse? What verse is that? Verse 13, very last phrase. It says, no, my daughters, for it is exceedingly bitter to me for your sake that the hand of the Lord has gone out against me. You see the root issue for Naomi? It's not necessarily the fact that if she doesn't have a husband, she can't have sons for her, daughters-in-law. It's not necessarily the fact that she wants to go back alone. She doesn't want them to follow her because the hand of God is against her from her perspective. She believes at this particular point in time in the narrative, we don't have any other evidence, but she believes from her perspective that God is against her. That God has judged her for her actions. So you go back to the beginning illustration. She believes that God had abandoned her. And that if her daughters-in-law come with her, they're going to fall under judgment too. That's why she's saying, return back, go go back to Moab. Go back to your place where you can find security. Go back. Don't follow me because God is against me. Have you ever felt that in your life? I mean, be honest. Where you don't want to be around people. When it feels like God is against you, you don't want to be around people. When you... Something happens, a circumstance comes up in your life, and you feel as if God has just said, I am against you. Yeah, let's be honest. 
I've felt that. When it feels like your circumstances dictate your next few steps. When it feels as if you just don't want to go to church anymore. You don't want to read your Bible anymore because every time you hear the word God, you just hate them and you cringe them a little bit more. When it feels as if uh, you try to pray and you bless people as Naomi did. Hey, you go back, may the Lord God bless you, and you don't believe it in the first place because you're not experiencing the blessing of God in your own life. And so the irony is, how can you pray for someone to be blessed when you don't even experience it yourself? This feeling of abandonment, this feeling of pain, this feeling of fear and anxiety and hurt. This is Naomi's heart. This is her root issue. She believes that God is absolutely set against her. And this is why she wants her daughters-in-law to go back to Moab. She doesn't want them to come under the judgment of God. She doesn't want them to experience the pain and abandonment that she felt. Just listen to the anger that she has against God. And typically, I think for some people, we want to start judging Naomi, don't we? Well, you just don't have enough faith, Naomi. Just believe. Just believe. (laughs) I don't know. I kind of, I empathize with Naomi here. (laughs) I feel her. I get the pain. I get this sense of abandonment. Now, notice this from her perspective. Nowhere in the text does it say that God is against Naomi. Nowhere in the text does it. This is all from her perspective. Even the very beginning of the passage where it talks about a famine in the land, it doesn't say that God did it. The implication is that he probably did it. Maybe. We're not sure. But from her perspective, it feels as though God is completely against her. God is against Naomi. And that's why she says, return back to Moab, my daughters. Turn back. Flee from me. Run away from me. Because if you come with me, guess what? God's going to hate you too. God's going to be against you. That's a good way to witness to somebody, isn't it? (laughs) Yeah, follow me around. You know, be a companion with me because God's going to hate you for the rest of your life. Yeah. We'd say, Naomi, you need to take a few classes on evangelism, don't you? But notice what they do in verse 14. And they lifted up their voices and wept again. Now notice the last phrase here. Very telling sign in the narrative. And Orpah kissed her mother-in-law. So Orpah, what does she do? She runs. Very ironic that her name means gazelle. Gazelles prance and run away. When fear comes, when tragedy comes, she's running. She kisses her mother-in-law. She's obeying her mother-in-law. Right? We have to give her credit for that at least. Go back to Moab. No, I don't want to go back. Go back to Moab because God's, God's against me. Okay, I'm going to go. <laughs> I, I'm, I'm going to go back to Moab. Finally, you convinced me. Yeah, because I don't want God to hate me. So she kisses her mother-in-law. She ca- says goodbye. She hugs her. She kisses her. I mean, imagine this. She spent 10 years with her in the country of Moab. She knows her mother-in-law. She knows the, the deep, dark secrets of the family. She's been there. Imagine how b- heartbreaking this is for Orpah to say, okay, I'm gone. But notice what the, very, the next phrase says, but Ruth, but Ruth, very, in Hebrew, it's very telling. It's what we call a disjunctive clause. The author is highlighting the character of Ruth here, not Orpah, but Ruth, what does she do? Clung to her. This is the very same word that's used in Genesis chapter 2, where it says that a husband shall leave his father and mother and cling to his wife, cleave to his wife. Very same word. The, the, the idea here is that in spite of what's going on in her life, Ruth makes the decision here to say, hey, God may be against you, but I'm going to be with you. In spite of everything that has happened in your life, Naomi, and in my life, because she lost a husband too. She knows the pain, the feeling of loneliness and abandonment and fear. This is what I'm going to do. I'm going to cling to you, Naomi. And so you see this third interaction in verse 15. And so Naomi said, see, your sister-in-law has gone back to her people and to her gods. 
She's gone back to her people and to her God. She didn't go back with Yahweh. She didn't go back with the covenant God of Israel. She goes back to Kishmas, the God of Moab. Uh, yeah, the God of Moab. She goes back to those gods. And she tells her daughter-in-law, for the fourth time, return after your sister-in-law. She doesn't even refer to her as Orpah anymore. It's simply your sister-in-law. Follow her. Return back with her. You see, very interesting that this word return has a very important point. This constant return. Return back. Go back. Return back. Go back. Four times it says in the narrative that Naomi says this to her daughter-in-law, Ruth. But verse 16 comes along and we see the narrative change. Stay with me. We see the narrative change in verse 16. We see the character of Ruth come out. We see this woman of valor. This woman of strength. Verse 16. But, change in the narrative. Ruth said, do not urge me to leave you. You know what this word means? Leave? Abandon. Do not tell me to abandon you or return from following you. Imagine what kind of courage this took to stand to take to stand up to her mother-in-law and say, You've told me four times I'm not gonna obey you. <laughs> Don't tell me to abandon you. Don't tell me to turn back from following you. For here's the reason. Notice this. For where you go, I will go. Where you lodge, where you stay, I will stay. Go, go to verse 17 real quick. We're going to skip a phrase. We're going to go to verse 17. Where you die, I will die. Will you be buried? And there will I be buried. May the Lord God do so to me and more if anything but death parts from me. Basically, she says, if, uh, if I do anything that's disobeying to you, if I don't follow you, if I, don't go, if I go back on my promise, may God kill me. That's what she means by that last phrase. But you see what's in the very center of her statements. Where you go, I will go. Where you lodge, I will lodge. Do you see what the next phrase is? Your people will be my people. Your God, my God. See that? In the midst of her circumstance, she doesn't blame God for her circumstance. You see that? See the irony there? The juxtaposition between Naomi and Ruth? Naomi saying, God hates me. God's against me. Why? It's indicative. It seems like I'm from her circumstances. Her husband died, son died. Yeah, God must hate me now. God's against me. But you see what Ruth does. Instead of blaming God, she embraces God in spite of her circumstances. She embraces God in the midst of her pain. And when it feels as if all the world is crashing in upon her, Everything she knows at this point in time in the narrative is completely thrown up in the air because she decides to go to a people and to a land that she's never been to. She is embracing God in the unknown. She is embracing God in spite of her circumstances while her mother-in-law is blaming God for her circumstances. Your people will be my people. Your God, Yahweh, is going to be my God, Yahweh. I mean, imagine the faith here. Because you have Naomi saying, <laughs> you don't want to follow me because your God, my God's going to hate you. And Naomi says, okay. Or Ruth says, let's go. I want to return back with you. I want to go to, Mo, uh, I want to, go to Bethlehem. I want to go to the house of bread because that's where God's acting. And I want to embrace him with everything I have. It's a matter of... Of faith. That's what it comes down to. It's a matter of faith. When it feels as if everything is going wrong, she decides that she wants to return back, not just to the people of Israel and to the land of Israel where there's chaos and anarchy because there's no king, no leader whatsoever when everybody's doing right in their own eyes. She decides to return back, embracing the covenant God of the entire universe. That's faith. That's faith. When it feels as if the world has completely abandoned you. When it feels as if that circumstance comes up in your life when you lose somebody. When it feels as if everything is just 
whatever in your life, what do you do? Are you going to blame God for your circumstances? I know that's, be honest, that's what I did. God, you did this. You did this to my daughter. Start blaming myself. What did I do? What sin did I commit that caused you to hate me and hate my daughter? What did I do? Instead of blaming God for my circumstance, what should I have done? Embrace God in spite of him. To say, God, you know what? I really don't know what's happening. I don't know what's going on in my life. You do. You may have caused it. You may not have caused it. I don't need to ask those theological questions because I'm not going to find out in the first place. All I have to do is have faith and believe God in spite of the circumstance. That's exactly what Ruth does in our text. And so what does Naomi do in verse 18? And Naomi saw that she was determined to go with her, and she said no more. Now, we don't know the intent of which this is written. We don't know if Naomi's just like, well, I have this crummy little daughter-in-law going to fall in behind me now. We don't know if there's some sort of animosity against Ruth and Naomi. We don't know that. I mean, she's disobeying her mother-in-law, Naomi, or Ruth is. So we don't know if this must have been an awkward traveling situation for them because they're going from Moab to, to Bethlehem. That's a few days journey. So have you ever been in a car with somebody you've had a disagreement with and there's just tension that you can cut with a knife? I imagine that's kind of going on in our narrative here. And so she said absolutely no more. No more. So what happens in verse 19? Very interesting. Look at what the author says. And so the two of them, not just one, even though Naomi wanted to go back alone, it's not just Ruth returning back to Moab. No, she's not doing that now. But the two of them went until they came to the house of bread, back to Bethlehem, where God is blessing and has visited his people. And so what happens? They came to Bethlehem and the whole town had stirred because of them. Now, you got to remember, this has been 10 years since Naomi's been back in Bethlehem. And she said, and they said, is this Naomi? I mean, imagine you haven't seen somebody for 10 years and they, what happens? You get old, right? And you see this woman walk back and, is this Naomi? Is it, we've heard the stories. God must be against her. She has no husband, no son, no sons. Now she has this, who's this girl walking with her? She's a foreigner. She's a Moabite. So what happens? And she said to them, do not call me Naomi. Do not call me pleasant. Call me Mara, meaning bitter. <laughs> Don't call me pleasant. Call me bitter for the Lord because the Almighty has dealt very bitterly with me. You can just hear the bitterness in her voice, can't you? From her perspective. God has dealt with me bitterly. For I went away full and the Lord has brought me back empty. For why call me pleasant? Why call me Naomi for when the Lord has testified against me? He has bore witness against me. And the Almighty has brought this calamity upon me. Oh, man. At least three times in our text, from Naomi's perspective, she believes that God has it out to get, to get her. She believes that God is out to completely ransack her life. Notice the irony here, though. It says, the Lord brought me, took me away full, but has brought me back empty. Very interesting that it began with an empty house of bread. But notice at the very last verse, and they came to Bethlehem at the beginning of barley harvest. The Lord has actually brought her back full. But it's not in the way that she expects. Because as we're, as we're going to see over the next few weeks, next four weeks, we're going to see that the Lord has acted to bring fullness to Naomi. But he doesn't do it just by providing bread for her. He doesn't do it just by giving her all these blessings. He does it through a particular individual, Ruth herself. So the irony is, even though she thinks that she went away full and has gone away empty, the opposite is true. She went away f empty, but has come back full. Not because of the blessings in her life of bread, but because Ruth is with her. Ruth has remained loyal to Naomi in spite of her circumstances. 
And so what happens? So Naomi returned. And Ruth the Moabite, Ruth the foreigner, her daughter-in-law with her, who returned from the country of Moab. And they came to Bethlehem at the very beginning of the barley harvest. Two points I want to show you just real quick. Naomi wants to return back to Bethlehem alone because she feels as if God is against her. She believes that God has abandoned her, so she wants to return alone. Ruth, on the other hand, in spite of her circumstances, says, No, I want to return back with you to the house of bread. I want to return back with you in spite of your circumstances, in spite of my circumstances. Notice this. She embraces God ultimately by embracing her mother-in-law. She remains loyal to her mother-in-law and faithful to her mother-in-law in in spite of her circumstances. What happens here in the text? We see something very important. That Ruth's actions of embracing her mother-in-law and embracing God demonstrates what God ultimately does for us in spite of our circumstances. We see that Ruth's loyalty and faithfulness to her mother-in-law demonstrates the loyalty and faithfulness of God to us, to his people. That when it seems like everything has hit the fan, to use that phrase, when it feels like everything has completely gone down the tubes, when God, when it feels like God has abandoned you and is against you, just a feeling. That feeling of abandonment is just a feeling. It's not a reality. Notice it's all from her perspective, Naomi's perspective. Nowhere does the author say, yeah, God is against her. Nowhere does the author say that. She believes that's what's happening, but that's not a reality in her life. Ruth demonstrates the theological reality here. That I am going to remain faithful to my mother-in-law in in spite of our circumstances. I am going to embrace her and the covenant God of Israel and her people in spite of the circumstances. Which ultimately demonstrates what God does for us, us in spite of our circumstances. That God embraces us. That he is loyal to us. He is faithful to us in spite of our circumstances. But notice what God does throughout the whole thing. It begins with the famine. He blesses his people. And what's happening at the very end of the text? It resets the story for us. In the house of bread, there's a harvest. God remains faithful to his people. Even when it's in the time of the judges. Have you ever read the book of Judges before? It's a pretty gruesome little book, isn't it? There are two scenes that happen in Bethlehem even. Micah marries a, um, um, uh, Micah brings a Levite uh, who's an idolater into his house in Bethlehem in the book of Judges. And there was, then there was a concubine, a prostitute in, uh, in the book of Judges that resided in Bethlehem. Remember that woman that was chopped up in 12 pieces in the book of Judges? Yeah, that was her. She was from Bethlehem. So Bethlehem's not a really good place to be. It, this, is, this is basically like the south side of Dallas. You don't want to be in Bethlehem at this point in time. In the land of Israel. <laughs> Sorry if anybody's from the south side of Dallas. I didn't mean that offensively or anything. Uh, we'll, we'll edit that from, our, uh, from the audio. Because I have some friends from south Dallas. But the point is, you don't want to be in Bethlehem at this time. When there's no king in Israel. When, there's, when everybody's doing right in their own eyes. What happens here? In spite of all this, you have a foreigner. You have Ruth, the Moabite. Embracing the covenant God of Israel. When Naomi, the Israelite, doesn't. This shows the faith of Ruth here. And when uh, Kaylee and I went uh, Wednesday to the appointment, uh, after we got out of the procedure and after we uh, finished all that, uh, up, we were in the little post-op room and and uh, Sophia begins to wake up and she's kind of moving around and she just loses it. She begins to cry. She begins to well because the anesthesia is wearing off. Her throat's a little scratchy. It's beginning to hurt. And guess who shows up? The social worker. And she says, hey, uh, I heard her crying. Do you want me to bring some soft music to you? No. 
Do not bring soft music. She's fine. And that's the point of our narrative. In spite of the crisis, in spite of the soft music that plays to get us really depressed and feels as if God has abandoned us, no. We're fine, not because of the circumstance. Where Kaylee and I weren't fine because Sophia was sitting there crying. We were fine because we decided to embrace the covenant God of the entire universe. That in spite of our circumstance, it didn't matter what the result was going to be, whether she was getting worse or whether she was getting better, we made the decision, God, we're not going to blame you. We will embrace you. God, in spite of everything in our life, we're not going to be like Naomi. We're going to be like Ruth. So as Pam and Kevin, Elias in an invitation song, I want to pose that question to you. Will you be like Naomi and blame God for your circumstance? Or are you going to be like Ruth and embrace God in spite of your circumstance?